Hello, everybody. Happy Saturday afternoon. I'm Zach Flock here for our Director Emeritus Lecture. Uh, Father Sean Clerken will join us in just a minute for a very ambitious topic today, the delicate balance, hierarchies of responsibility versus toxic authority. There's even more to the title, but I'll let Sean give you the full title in just a minute. Uh, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items, uh, things that we want to let you know about coming up here at Drama Shop. Um, first of all, you may have seen on Facebook yesterday, um, we put out there that we will be having auditions on May 9th for our final main stage uh, production of the season, which will actually be presented outdoors at WQLN in June. Um, we're really excited for that one. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what it is just yet. Uh, we're waiting on final approval for that license. Uh, hopefully we'll have that in the next day or so, but we are planning auditions on May 9th. Uh, Father Sean will be directing that production as well. So it uh, should be a really great time. And we're excited to be doing live theater in front of a live audience outdoors at QLN. Um, we've been doing all sorts of stuff this past year streaming. It'll be nice to have some folks right there in front of us as we perform that final main stage show coming up in June. Um, so mark the calendars for May 9th for auditions for that show. You can find information on our Facebook page as well. Also want to let you know about our staged reading of Hamlet coming up on May 14th. Um, we will do it live on May 14th, and then it'll be available on demand after the fact. That'll be pay what you can, like all of our staged readings. Um, we suggest maybe a $5 ticket price, but it is truly pay what you can. So um, whatever works for your budget. Please to share that the role of Hamlet will actually be played by our friend Alaska from RuPaul's Drag Race. Really excited for that. That's going to be really cool. Um, complete casting will be announced in the next few days here. So I'm um, very excited about both of those projects coming up that will then wrap up our 2020-2021 season, which has truly been a season unlike any other. Um, please join me in welcoming our Director Emeritus, Father Sean Clerken. And the crowd goes wild. wild. Yeah, because on a sunny, gorgeous uh, eerie spring day, everyone is sitting around. Well, and, and, and you're right. Uh, Zach and I were talking earlier. I went, boy, I hope nobody's sitting here watching me. Um, <laughs> I, actually, I'm always hoping somebody's listening. But um, but it's also great to know that this is going to be shared beyond this point. So that's really great. Absolutely. And folks, if you do have questions uh, throughout the course of the lecture, drop them in the comments and um, we'll let Sean get started. But I'll pop up questions as he moves through his talk and I lose my earbud here. Um, but Sean, I will, first of all, Give us the full title if you could. Okay, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I said to Zach <laughs> earlier, I said, I, I, I don't know if I was like really tired when I came up with this title, but um, uh, last week when we were in conversation about it, I said, uh, how about um, the delicate balance, hierarchies of responsibility versus toxic authority, hyphen, the challenges of creating productive, creative, innovative, and collaborative artistic experiences. I, it, 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 I felt like I was a Harvard graduate student or something. I'm, yeah. I, I was, must have been channeling somebody like that because um, I had just finished reading one of the many articles about Scott Rudin, as uh, many people had done. I, a lot of people had shared them uh, on Facebook, on the various theater sites and Erie Theater and the Erie Playhouse and PACA and All in Act and, of course, Drama Shop. We were all engaged in this conversation. And... Uh, and I was uh, just reflecting on on that, and I thought maybe maybe I just need to throw some ideas out there, maybe share a little bit of my own experiences in terms of artistic collaboration, some of the challenges I have faced uh, in, in moments of a challenge, uh, and uh, also then um, tap into some of my other resources. I'm also a minister, and I have a background in conflict management, and uh, and uh, so so I, I've, I've had a few courses, and I've had a lot of opportunities. When you're in higher education for 32 years, you spend a lot of time in conflict management. That's right. <laughs> sometimes in the classroom, sometimes uh, in the staff and faculty meetings, but it's always it's always a part of what we do because people are people in higher education are very passionate. You know, you, you get a couple degrees and you think you know everything. Um, I just described myself. By Boy, the way. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> This is all news to me. It is, isn't it? Yeah. And then when you add in the whole, all of the, all of the wonderful complexities of generational understanding, the boomers not turning anything over to us Gen Xers, and then us Gen Xers looking at the whining of the millennials, whiners. Um, that's you. Uh, and 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 then we have the uh, the Gen Zs coming up who are just looking at everything, going, mm, I think we just want to be hermits and have a cottage someplace in Montana. I, you know, it is very interesting that 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 uh, the generational uh, uh, approaches also. Change the way that we perceive things. 
Um, and I think generations are what it's all about. Too. Yeah, and Gen Z is here to save us all from ourselves and from each other. So. As they will tell us <laughs> every single day. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sean, I couldn't fit that whole title on the screen, so I hope you're cool with what I did fit. Um, again, folks, if you have questions, uh, drop them in the comments, and we will uh, filter those along. Sean, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, and I'll jump back in in a few minutes, but uh, awesome. the floor is yours. Oh, uh, great. Thanks, Zach. And if any questions do come up, Zach will share those with me as we go along. Um, I, I was really been thinking a lot about this particular topic. Um, uh, as somebody who came of age in the 1970s and 1980s and the year before we were um, being sensitive to issues of power and how power was being manipulated. Uh, I remember reading in Michael Shirtliff's book, Audition, he described a lot of the practices. Um, there used to be a practice called the casting couch. Hey, Brian, nice to see you. Uh, the casting couch, um, it was a legend, or so we thought, but it wasn't really a legend. It was the idea that if you were a performer and you were trying to get a job as a performer, many times you had to interview and or audition with a director or a producer or both. Um, or a casting agent. And many of these individuals would be respectful of their opportunities and respectful of the, uh, of the power and uh, the, the responsibilities that they would have. Others, not so much. Uh, you might actually be invited into places like we've heard from Scott Rudin or even worse from Harvey uh, Weinstein and a, a few of our, um, a, a few other, uh, other individuals. Um, Harvey Weinstein? No, not Harvey Weinstein, the other one. Oh, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I I didn't write it down. So I, sometimes these words come into me. Um, uh, uh, Harvey Firestein is not the one I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about Weinstein, the producer director, um, who uh, is right now going to be uh, finally extradited to face charges of sexual harassment and sexual abuse. Um, I grew up in that world. Uh, I I would um, I I don't want to name names or anything, but I certainly have felt the pressure of, and also felt uh, unwanted and unwarranted uh, advances uh, during my time when I was in high school in the marching band. Uh, there was an individual who was associated with the band, uh, who was not necessarily a member of the faculty, uh, but was also uh, was 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 somebody who worked with our band. Um, and this individual was one of the. He was a butt pincher, uh, to be honest, and. Uh, and um, also would do leers, kind of st staring at you in inappropriate ways. And I remember thinking how uncomfortable I was. Um, but also at that time, how, how, how much I wanted the sense of affirmation. We're talking about a 15, 16 year old young man uh, who wanted that sense of affirmation, wanted the sense of opportunity as a performer, as a trumpet player. Um, and so I was willing to, to smile back and uh, say nothing. Uh, fortunately, it never led to anything more than just leers and uh, a couple of unwarranted touches here or there. Um, also, in, in, throughout my life, uh, there's always been that kind of um, uh, question a, about what is it that we, we need to do in order to get a part or get a role. Um, I, I feel fortunate that I have worked really hard to develop the skills and talents that I have as a singer and actor. Um, and I've always felt that any role that I had was always given to me, not because of uh, how cute I was or, uh, or, or how willing I was to, to wink back, but always about, you know, the talent. The talent was there. But that is not necessarily the story that other people have. Michael Shirtliff's book, in his audition book, he talks about the casting couch, and he says, you know, it's important that until you are in a position of authority, unfortunately, you have to play by the rules that are established. I'm really glad we've moved beyond Michael Shirtliff's perspective. And we actually are saying, no, it's not about who's in power determining what, what gets to be said and what gets to be done. It's about, it's about all of us preserving those relationships that power implies. Um, the, my, the, the title of this, Hierarchies of Responsibility versus Toxic Authority. When we talk about power and we talk about conflict, and individuals in conflict. Uh, that's really, I think, where we're sitting in this realm right now, as we look at individuals who have power over the over other people. Um, when we talk about power, power is the ability to influence or to control people or events. Uh, this is coming uh, from my textbook that I use for interpersonal communication. Uh, it is written by uh, Steve McCornick, uh, and it's a book that I use frequently. I use it when I'm teaching the course. Um, and he, that's what he says about power. It's the ability to influence or control. And I think it's really important that that means that there are going to be people in power. That's just the way all things are structured. Um, many times uh, there are supervisors. Many times there are directors. Many times there are, in my world, deans and uh, vice presidents who will have some kind of power or some kind of um, structural uh, control over me and also over the academic units or anything that I'm doing. 
In the theater, we have the same structures. We have producers, certainly, that are controlling the purse strings, but then we have the artistic directors, the individuals who are in charge of the final product. You know, they're, they're, they're collaborating with other designers and other art artists. Um, they're directing productions. They are guiding the cast and the collaborators toward an opening night uh, that hopefully will be successful. Um, and it is natural that in those situations, there are natural power affi aff aff affinities. Um, in directing, for example, we talk frequently about this ultimate director and this ultimate collaborator. Um, both are legitimate within the structure. There are some directors, for example, who have a very clear vision, uh, a very clear idea of what they want to have in the production. They're almost like a sculptor. And the rest of us who are actors or designers are simply clay that they will manipulate and shape into that kind of play that they see. They absolutely see it from the first time they read the script or the first time they sit down to create the work. Then we have another group of directors, and I try to fall more on this side myself, a group of directors who are much more collaborative. Um, they're uh, much more interested in what can we collectively as artists come up with here. Um, those are the kind of directors who say to an actor, where are we going with this production? And what do you see in this production? Or they say to designers, um, how do you envision the, the shape of the stage? Or how do you envision the use of video or the, the use of sound effects in this production? So between those two poles of this kind of um, uh, Charles Merowitz in his book on directing says, the comme ça directly, just like this. And the laissez-faire director, not laissez-faire meaning hands off, but laissez-faire meaning I am not going to manipulate it. I'm going to work together and try to hold together a collaborative team. So the power exists within directing. The power exists within uh, producing. The power exists within choreographers. The power exists with actor managers, any number of individuals who are pulling strings back and forth. And frequently, we run into situations of conflict. Sometimes the conflict is over the work itself, and sometimes the conflict comes about because of the nature of how somebody visualizes their responsibility in these moments. Responsibility versus toxic authority. It's embedded in the conversation. Um, we have all experienced those moments where there is conflict. Um, sometimes the conflict begins with some kind of perception, maybe the perception that on the director's side or on the producer's side that the, the collaborators are not respecting that or honoring that responsibility the individual has. Um, sometimes it's on the other side of it where the creative artists that are involved do not see that or feel that the director or the producer are recognizing their contributions as well. Sometimes it has to do with clashes in goals or behavior. Um, sometimes we have different ideas. Um, an actor who is playing a role may have a very clear vision of that role, and it might not be the same vision that a designer has. I remember at VCU, a young man who just didn't think that his pants were the right length uh, for Algernon in uh, The Importance of Being Earnest. Um, he learned very quickly, though, that the costume designer didn't necessarily uh, agree with that and that the costume designer's work had to be affirmed and honored in that moment. She actually, uh, he tried to change the hem of his pants. The next night when he put them on, suddenly there were suddenly little tiny pins within the um, seams around his crotch. <laughs> she got her point across, certainly. Um, there's other moments where um, it's also behavioral issues in terms of conflict, how we behave, how we relate to one another. There are some directors who just believe that they are on a pedestal. Um, they are individuals who might see themselves as being absolutely in control. Again, many times the author director, or at least maybe even the role of director as opposed to doing the direction. But do you respect my position? Do you respect my role? And, and I don't like the way that you're behaving toward me because of that. And many times actors will also see the same things. It's like, well, you know, we are collaborators. And even though you're a, a come saw, do it my way director, do you respect um, and do you behave toward me in that kind of collaborative, safe and healthy environment? Um, sometimes we have to remember that conflict is also a process. It's not something that just starts right like that. It's something that is developed over time. Um, and a lot of times the processes are, are things that need to be discussed and, and shared back and forth. We also recognize that conflict is dynamic, that it is something that waxes and wanes. Um, it is not necessarily the same for every single in individual. I know that there are some directors, for example, who just look at casts as burdens that we have to somehow coach into our vision as opposed to um, opportunities and collaborators who are working with us on that. I know some actors in, uh, who look at some directors and choreographers as, oh my gosh, they're just gonna be so mean to me, or oh my gosh, they're just gonna be so insulting. And and sometimes they, they, they get notes, for example, um, 
Joe Grillick always says, take the note, just take the note. Uh, it, it's, it's intended to, to, to supply you with, uh, with some direction and also hopefully help, help your performance to get better. But sometimes that criticism can be hurtful and, and sometimes we feel it more often than others as well. Um, so there's always this kind of strange dynamic then between power and conflict in these collaborative situations that we're in. Um, we always do this. You know, somebody has to cast the show. Somebody's got the power for doing it. And once we're cast, we're all in it. To, we're all in it to get right. We have to work together to try to find our way through it. Um, there's some things about power that I think are really important. Power is always present in our collaborative arts. Uh, we, we cannot avoid it. Um, I am trained, my background, my MFA is in directing, uh, and I have been a director for 37, 38 years now, I think. Yeah, from the first time I directed a show, 37 years now. So so I, I, I feel pretty pretty confident in myself as a director. Um, I recognize, however, that, um, that I also have a responsibility that goes with that. Uh, when I take the role as a director, um, sometimes, if it depends on how my vision is for production, I get very specific and sometimes I'm much more open to conversation. Um, but there is a power and people will turn to me with that kind of answers, you know. And Bogart always said that when an actor asks you a question as a director, you better have an answer for them by the time you, she always says, uh, she'll sit in the in the auditorium and she'll be asked a question. And she said, I stand up and I walk to the stage. And by the time I get to the stage, she said, I better have an answer for the actor. Even if it's a temporary answer, I have to have that answer because that's my job as director. They're looking to me for that, for that opportunity. Sometimes power is symmetrical, meaning I have my responsibilities, you have your responsibilities, and through our shared responsibilities and shared power, we come to an understanding. But sometimes it's complementary in, in terms of power. Sometimes we are placed under the tutelage or under the facilitation or direction or guidance of somebody else. And it's their job, essentially, to make sure that we are doing our job. Um, that kind of power structure is a complementary structure. I have supervisors again, and then they have supervisors. And, and I am going to be assessed and evaluated by my supervisor. That's part of what happens. They'll give me good ideas on how to improve the areas that I need to improve in. They'll also reward me and pat me on the back when I do something right. I think that that's also part of this idea of power structures. Um, power can be used ethically or unethically. A lot of the questions we have over Scott Rudin and others uh, in the entertainment field right now have, has to do with whether we believe that their power is being exerted or being used in an ethical way. Are they, are they abusing the power or are they using the power to benefit everybody involved? A lot of questions also about bullying, a lot of questions about sex sexual inappropriateness, uh, all the way from harassment up to sexual abuse. Um, these are questions that are that are Im important to, to consider, but we, we also have to recognize that there are unethical uses of power and they cannot be tolerated uh, and certainly not in a creative environment. Power is always granted by the people who place those individuals in power. I don't seize power as a director. I assume the power that is given to me because that is my responsibility. Um, as I get ready to direct the next drama shop show, which will be announced soon, uh, a very exciting play, award-winning drama, um, I'm excited about uh, stepping into it, but I, I recognize that drama has entrusted me with the power of direction, that I have a responsibility to the cast, I have a responsibility to the playwright, I have a responsibility to the audiences that are gonna be there. And with that power comes great responsibility. Um, and power will oftentimes influence the sense of how we understand these conflicts that go back and forth as well. Um, so I, as I, I'm thinking about this there, I, I recognize that there are also currencies of power, meaning there are things that are given to me uh, that allow me to have the power and to use power effectively. I am given resources, certainly as a director, I'm given the resources of the, of the theater of drama shop and any of us who are directors have the resources available to us. When I directed at the Playhouse, it was really nice to have a full-time uh, costume designer and a costumer. It was uh, great to have a full-time scenic designer and a person who was there for lighting. It's fascinating to me to see how that those those um, those individuals become resources to me as a power person. Um, same thing at Drama Shop. We are much more of a volunteer organization, but we still have people who are committed theater artists. You don't have to get paid to be legit, right? Um, and so I'm getting ready to work with Zach and getting ready to work with Julie Lakahi as we uh, plan our approach toward this piece. And they are resources, and I'm a resource to them as well uh, in, in terms of power. Power can also be a currency. Another per currency of power is expertise currency, meaning 
those persons who have done it a very long time. I very much trust those individuals who have been producing for decades. I have a great respect for Almi, my wife, for example, and she oftentimes has great notes for me following productions and rehearsals. Um, and I turn to her for those notes because she knows what she's talking about. She has been doing it or did it for much longer a time than I did. Um, I also recognize other people's expertise as well. Expertise in marketing, for example. I am not a marketer. Hi, Luke Nicole Lossi has a post, has a statement there. Interesting way of describing power as a responsibility rather than something that is seized in certain ways. Amen, my friend. Um, that is what's important. It is, it is something that is granted or, or something that is gifted to an individual. I really appreciate that. But when it comes to marketing, back to you, Nicole, um, you're the expert here. You know an image that is going to strike up a response from an audience. You know words that are going to get people's responses. You know how to send out a social media post at the right time and in the right context and on the right platform. Those are your expertise. And so I would always default to somebody else who has an expertise in anything. Um, is in the same way that I would hope that they would default to me on expertise on direction or expertise on, on how to cast a show or expertise on how to block a show or how to, st how to stage a show. I love when people ask me my opinion because my opinion is probably more than just opinion. Given my expertise, it's probably become fact. Um, and that's a reality too. Um, we also have social networking and also uh, the ability to be personal or intimate. And these are all currencies that we also explore. Um, we all are engaged in, in one another's work. In Erie, Pennsylvania especially, I don't think of ourselves as distinctive theaters. I think of ourselves as the Erie theater community. And we may play in certain places, but it doesn't matter. You can have breakfast at, at Tim Hortons, or you can have breakfast at Bob Evans, or you can drive through McDonald's, you know, wherever you eat your breakfast. Um, but we all need the breakfast in order to be energized and empowered to go out there and tell good stories and share them with our community. Um, so I really like the idea that we do have networking. Personal versus intimacy, I think, is really important as well. When we develop relationships, when we have those kinds of relationships in power situations, we have to honor those relationships. Um, sometimes I'm good at that and other times I'm not. I, I think it's sometimes challenging in theater, especially when we have six to eight weeks of really intense rehearsal and performance time. And then suddenly that time ends. Uh, many of us who do this for a living um, have to move on to the next production. Uh, and we don't always get to have the chance to maintain certain friendships and certain certain affiliations. I've always treasured, for example, the two my two favorite uh, social groups. One is my poker buddies, uh, Joe Grulick, Charlie Corator, Rich Trisbiak, Patrick Thiem, uh, John Thiem, Bob Martin. Oh, I love getting together. And Jimmy Godolfo, you're always there in spirit, whether you're actually there or not. Um, this is a really close group of people that we have an opportunity to get together. And Friday nights, once a month, or sometimes a little less frequently, uh, we were able just to get together in April um, uh, after COVID. We're all, all vaccinated, and we were so thankful to be able to sit down in the same space, telling the same stupid jokes, berating one another with the same stupid insults, um, playing the one wonderful games that we create uh, for poker. I, I still like crisscross applesauce, although my, my, my buddies don't really care for my games that I create. Um, but there's a personal relationship that, that's implied there and also a, an exchange of power within that relationship. There's also intimate power as well. When we open ourselves up to collaboration, artistic collaboration, and we open ourselves up to interpretation, um, whether you are a visual artist who is trying to encapsulate your vision and put it down concretely someplace, or an actor who takes on a character and really begins to empathize and sympathize with the character to such a point that you embody the character during the performance, um, those kind of intimate moments have to be honored in a very special way. Um, and the intimacy with which we approach our art. Uh, unlike other artists, performers especially, um, and musicians, I think, too, we become a part of the music. We become a part of the play in a very special way. It's not like working with canvas and putting pigment down on canvas or working with a material and fashioning it until it's done. We actually embody the art that we do. And so I think in some ways that intimacy is really important to honor. And sometimes that intimacy is something that can be powerful and also potentially um, vulnerable on the negative side as well. Um, that power can hurt us. So all of these conversations and all of these um, subjects on power and conflict kind of invite me into a place where I'm sitting there thinking, okay, so what exactly do I think it's important to do as I look at the way that people are responding to things like Scott Rudin and others? Um, 
And so the, the challenges, I think, are to make sure that we, we recognize what power is. Uh, as Nicole pointed out, that we are gifted power. We are granted power. People turn to us and allow us to have the power over others. Sometimes they're structural and sometimes they are granted. Um, but it's really important for us to recognize that. I think we have to change the perception of power and control and management into other ways. I think power would be better to be seen as responsibility. I don't have power over you. I have responsibility to you and for you. My job here, for example, I have people who I, I direct uh, in the School of Communication and the Arts. I have faculty and staff that are under my supervision. But as a supervisor, I don't think of myself as looking at them, telling them when they're right or wrong. I think of it much more as I am here to facilitate you and your work. How can I help you? How can I provide you the resources? How can I provide you the opportunities that you need in order to do the work that you have to do? It's kind of what I also do in ministry too. I look at the church and say constantly, I'm just a priest here, you're the church. How can I help you to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, house the homeless? Uh, but that's a conversation for a different day and a different context. But I do have that notion of responsibility and not power. Control has to be changed, I think, to guidance. I am here to spark guidance in other persons. I'm here to share my expertise. I'm here to share my resources. But ultimately, I'm not here to shove them down anybody's throats. I'm here to use my resources and expertise and my networking in order to help other people to do the work that they have to do. So I'm here not necessarily to control somebody, but to guide somebody. And even in a come saw, do it my way kind of a moment, I'm not there to just tell somebody what to do or and fire them or get rid of them or berate them or insult them if they don't do it that way. I really want to be much more of a person who provides guidance, who helps somebody discover the pathway to the way that we're headed. Um, and finally, management versus facilitation. I'm not here to manage you. I'm here to facilitate you. I'm here to see you in a very, very different light. So I think that one of the things that we're being invited to do then, and if we imagine our, our, our perfect world then, can you imagine a production in which you walk in for the audition? And I have, I have not always been this director, and I have to be honest. Um, but you walk into the audition where your talents and gifts are affirmed, where you're appreciated just because you gave, you gave yourself, you gave 15 minutes of your time to jump onto Zoom or to walk into that theater. You gave the vulnerability of your performance and your, and your hope for something. You've tried your best. You really want to do something. Um, you really want a role or you want to be a, a part of something. Um, and can you imagine if the director, choreographer, vocal director, producers who are in the room there just treasure every single moment that you offer them? I have to say, this is not something I've always been good at doing. It's something I want to try to do better, always. Um, so so could, you, could you imagine that? Can you imagine going into a rehearsal in which, the, in which the director says, okay, I very clearly have a vision for, for the blocking. There are certain high points in the text. There are certain climax moments or important dramatic moments. And I have a very clear vision of where people should be standing, seated, where they should be moving and how they should be moving. But, but I'm willing to go on a little bit of a journey with you and so that we can collaborate together and find our ways from point A to point B, from this stage composition to that stage composition. How do you want to get from point A to point B? And how can I help facilitate that? And can you give me some creative solutions on that as well? Can you imagine a choreographer who says, don't do it just the way I do it, but embed your own gift, your own talent, your own, your own balance, your own form, your own individual talent and, and, and bring it to that space and allow it to be something that is something you're proud of offering as well as a, as a creative artist in yourself. Can you imagine those kinds of situations where we get to opening night and the director has, has helped everyone to get to that space where they actually have a production that is ready to be seen and everybody has come up from where they were uh, and grown and developed and, and certainly has, has gotten on that trajectory and the production continues to improve even after opening night. I love making sure that a show is ready to open on opening night, but I love how much a cast and a crew can learn about a show from opening night to closing night. Um, and I love going back and seeing a show that I haven't seen for a couple of rehearsals, surprised at what was happening and surprised at what I'm seeing. Um, usually the surprise is a positive surprise. <laughs> Although there are times sometimes where I'm sure actors or directors uh, or directors and designers and choreographers are not necessarily happy with what they saw. 
I remember when I saw Tommy, uh, the Who's Tommy in New York, and I walked in, I got one of those late tickets at TKTS, and I sat down in the back row of the theater. Uh, and there was one empty seat beside me on the, on the ground floor, right? And I couldn't see the top of the stage, but I saw most of the screens that were being used. And Des McEnough, the director choreographer of the musical, uh, Tony Award winner, um, comes in and sits down beside me. And as we're watching the production, there is one individual in the chorus who everybody else spins twice. This individual spun three times. Everybody else kicks it up to their uh, up to their waist level. This individual is kicking up to their shoulder. Uh, this individual is tossing their hair a little bit more when everybody else is a little bit more still, flexing a little bit more when everybody else is just relaxing and, and just being present and being embodied in the, sh in the show. And with each time this individual performer kind of hot dogged, you could hear Des McEnough go, ugh. Uh, uh. And I remember at intermission, I had a, a souvenir program and I handed it to him and I said, my wife's a choreographer director and would you mind signing this for me? And he said, absolutely, that's fine, absolutely. And I said, well, do you get a chance to come back to see the shows very often? He said, clearly not often enough. Um, so he didn't come back after intermission, but I suspect he went back and talked to the cast at intermission because for the second half of the show, this individual that was standing out from the chorus uh, kind of went back to blending in the way that they should. Um, they were kicking just the same way that everybody else was kicking. Their spins were exactly the same number of everybody else, and they really were not necessarily standing out, but they were doing their job as a member of the company. Um, so uh, just a little story about Des McEnough that I always appreciated. Uh, so anyway, we get to closing night, and we want everybody to have grown a little bit, and we can all then share that celebration as well. Conflict and power. It's kind of the nature of where we are. There are always going to be hierarchies. There's always going to be structures. Um, there's always going to be perceptions that we have to wrestle with. But it is absolutely important more than anything, I think, that we have to be gentle and kind to one another. And I close with this quote. This is, um, we are on the ancestral uh, lands of the Iroquois nation. Um, and so this quote actually comes from the Iroquois. And it says, the greatest strength is gentleness. The greatest strength is gentleness. I am always hopeful that those in power will be gentle with those who are not in power. That applies to me both as a person who is in power and as somebody who sometimes is subject to others and, and their power. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sean. I'd love to, to uh, continue the discussion and ask a few follow-ups if you are cool with that. I love um, follow-ups. Great. Um, so, you know, just kind of one of my observations, you know, having been doing theater since I was a, a child, basically, um, over the past, you know, 25 years or so. Um, I think one of the things I've noticed is that, to put it bluntly, I think we sometimes make excuses in the theater for a lack of professionalism in situations where we feel like we're among friends. You know, we develop those close bonds with people over the times that the time that we're in rehearsal. Um, how do you maintain that balance of professionalism versus those personal relationships. You know, you mentioned the group of, of guys that you often play poker with, right? Yeah. What's the difference between when you're in a poker game with them versus when you're directing them? We, that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, because you, you do have that personal relationship, but the, but the relationship has to, we have to honor the context of, of where, wherever we happen to be. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that those, those kind of friendships then do kind of change the way that we perceive those moments. Um, yeah, I, David Matthews, may he rest in peace, was a wonderful influence on me as a director. He taught me a lot, some good and some bad, but he taught me a lot as a director. Um, David was, oh, he was so um, flirtatious and he was so provocative, but I never ever felt like he was ever a threat to me. And I never felt like there was any, ever any kind of quid pro quo with him, you know, that I had to, had to respond or a wink or something like that uh, in order to, to get a role or to get an opportunity. When he cast a show, he cast a show. Mm -hmm. um, and he gave me many different opportunities. And we were friends. We were, we, we saw David and Judy quite frequently, um, uh, cer certainly when Seamus was younger and when they were still in town. Um, and we saw them uh, quite frequently. I, I, I never, I never felt like the, you know, the, the kind of conversations and the kind of jokes and the kind of things that he would say, um, I, he was he didn't separate those from place to place. And uh, and while I appreciated that, I oftentimes think, oh, David, I'm so glad you're not you're not in the business now because um, it's a very different time. You know, I think we have to stay in our compartments. I think we have to stay in our lanes. I, I think we have to respect yeah. um, the spaces in which we 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 exist. Um, there are things that I can I can say at the poker table with these guys on a Friday night at, at 11:30 p.m. 
that I would never say in a rehearsal hall because it would be inappropriate in that context. Um, and we can say whether, well, should it be inappropriate anytime? Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite there where we censor one another in terms of, of, of all things. Um, I do believe in cancel culture as long as we're canceling behaviors and not canceling individuals. You know what I mean? Um, and so what we're yeah, trying I've, to- Yeah, I've heard the phrase consequence culture being- I like that. I think that's, that's yeah, you know, I'm much- Recognize that in certain, con in certain contexts, things cannot be tolerated. Um, I will say, you know, I, I love humor and I use humor effectively or and sometimes ineffectively. And I'm always catching myself saying, is that funny or is that appropriate in this context? And I'm and I sometimes will step over that line because I, you know, I'm a Lewis Black fan. I am. Uh, I, I, I was always. a. Um, um, Oh, uh, oh gosh, the the great the great insult guy, um, Don Wrinkle, Don Rickles. I always appreciated his humor too. And and these guys were not nice. Uh, they were they were not kind. Even Bette Midler at moments was not kind. Um, as 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 wonderfully progressive and liberal as she is, um, there were times when she be she could be downright insulting to individuals who may see things from a different perspective than she. Um, so so I think yeah, I think context has a lot to do with it. You know, there are there are moments, and 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 also in those relationships, we 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 talk about. About that, um, when I work together on stage with Joe Gerlich, it's very different from when we when we're playing poker. You know, it's which is also very different from when I engage he and his family uh, in, in moments that we've had opportunities. I married uh, married his son last summer or last year, and I'll be marrying his other son coming up this summer. And uh, and it's a very different relationship because again, it it, it morphs, it changes. You know, um, no no no, you're no know where you are. I think. Yeah, and I also think sometimes we fall in that trap of thinking that the content of the show may influence what is or isn't appropriate behavior in the setting, mm -hmm. um, which is not always the case. You know, maybe the, the language or the material of the show might have a certain, you know, you mentioned Lewis Black, right? Yeah. Say if it's a Lewis Black piece, that may have certain you know, language, certain jokes that are made in the context of the show that in the show are appropriate. But that same tone or that same attitude is not necessarily appropriate in terms of how we interact with each other sure. in the process of working on that piece. Yeah, I mean, for example, the, the as yet unnamed drama shop show, the characters in this play represents, represent viewpoints that I do not hold and I do not support. But that's the point of the play is to help bring those perspectives to light and also recognize that even individuals who might seem to be very polemically charged yeah. are also in places of doubt and there and none of us none of us are absolutely carved in granite we are all works in process yeah 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 i think it's true i want to i want to ask you too about this idea of of tactics when it comes to directing in particular right that that we as directors often employ tactics to get performances or, or to, to get actors to explore the piece in certain ways. Um, I'm personally a fan of, and I perhaps learned this from you, if an actor makes a choice on their own, uh, it's, it's going to be probably a, a better performance or a better choice than if I give it to them, even though I may think from day one, man, I really want them to do X, right? Um, so over the course of a rehearsal period, I may use certain tactics, for lack of a better word, to guide them to making certain choices. Now, I think that's a different thing than being manipulative, right? But but I think that that can be a fine line, you know, the, the title delicate balance. So where do you find or how do you find that delicate balance between guiding versus uh, instructing versus manipulating? Yeah, well, you know, part of it is recognizing as a director, I do have control. I, I, I have to admit that that is, that is something that has been gifted to me. And if a cast approaches and looks at me, knowing that I have control over the final product, um, I, I, I find that to be very in, in, in invigorating, right? Um, but I'm like you, and that's Francis Hodge. So you may have stole it from me, but I got it from Francis Hodge's book on directing. Um, he said, you know, if, if an actor makes the discovery, they'll own it, right? right. So part of what we do as directors is help to lead actors, uh, we can call it manipulate, we can call it um, creatively guide, right? However we do it, but the actor has to make those decisions and discoveries on their own. But I think it's also that that's that's part of what we do. So we are we are going to be manipulating other uh, others as well. Um, but I don't want to think of it ever as I'm just I am manipulating with this sense of, you know, never, no, never touch an actor. It makes them feel like a, a puppet. 
was something that Ben Agresti always said. Um, uh, although, you know, and I think it's important that we honor, you know, distance and touch and, and haptics and, and, and all of those things. But we do recognize that if I can guide an actor to that discovery, or if they can guide me and explain to me why they've chosen something different from what I envisioned, we both, it's a win-win, right? Right. Uh, so it, it is a strategy that we use, but it's also um, it's also a responsibility. I, I an actor will will trust me. I also don't like it necessarily when an actor will say, "Oh, well, give me just give me the reading for this line." Uh, no, then you become a then you become a mimic, and you're only imitating my reading of the line. I don't want that to happen either, because then suddenly I, I listen to the stage and everybody sounds like Sean Clark, and I'm not interested in hearing two hours of Sean Clark. Nobody is Sean. Nobody. Is. <laughs> Yeah. And so, I mean, so it, it, it is interesting that way. Now there are some times, you know, certainly, you know, and I, I'm, I am a mover, not a dancer. And there's times where Richard Davis would have to, uh, Judy Green, may she rest in peace, would have to show me the step, just make me do it, make me do it the way that I'm supposed to do it. Totally love that. Please don't let me be the only chorus boy who's starting on the left foot when everybody else is starting on the right, you know? That's, right. Sometimes we do need that kind of intervention. You know, as you were saying that too, I thought it was kind of interesting too to think about, you know, just how open we are to those things as collaborative artists. Um, we have to recognize as individual artists as well that we are collaborators with the director. Right. We are collaborators with the other artists involved in a production. Sometimes we get a little territorial and we want to um, claim power that is not our power, or we want to claim an independence that's not an independence. None of us do this to get, uh, individually, and um, we are all doing it together. I mean, that's one of my favorite things about theater is of all the art forms it is the fact it is the most collaborative we are collaborating with the original narrator the, the authors the creators the composers the lyricists the book writers we are collaborating with the directors who are also visionary we're collaborating with designers who are doing three-dimensional and two-dimensional visuals we're collaborating with musicians who are also bringing their talents to the stage and dancers and and now videographers who are also inserting things it is it is 2D, 3D, architecture, literature, music, film, dance, all of that coming together in theater. Yeah. Um, and I think the more complex theater gets, the more important it is to have directors uh, and producers who honor those individual contributions while still maintaining a sense of, a sense of continuity for the entire production. Yeah. You mentioned the Anne Bogart quote earlier about you, if you don't have the answer when you stand up, you better have it by the time you get to the front of the theater. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, that's one thing that I, you know, I had heard that quote for years and I've kind of thrown it out um, to your point about collaboration. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've kind of moved to this place where I understand that ultimately it's my responsibility as a director to get us to an answer, but I've also accepted the fact that there may be rehearsals or moments or, you know, things in shows that I may get up and walk to that front of that stage and get there and go, I don't know, what do you guys think? You know, right. and I think that's maybe um, a shift in, in kind of uh, right. what, what's normally expected of a director as well. Right. And sometimes, and that's really good when you're working with seasoned director or seasoned actors who you trust. Yes, right. Um, but there are some times where somebody, and you know, there are moments where there's confidence and there's moments where there's not. And right. it's more, more in those moments where, where an actor just doesn't have the confidence to know what's going on. And you can tell also in the reading of the line and the, the way they're, 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 their physicality at that moment. And that might really need that person to step in there. You know, and even, even in giving the solutions, I, I try to always say, well, right now, you might want to think of it this way. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll change, but, but this is how I'm seeing it. And, and, and sometimes even providing that frame helps an actor go, oh, wow, no, I don't see that at all. But I do see, yeah, so sometimes just, yeah, but I think I think you're right. It, it absolutely depends on the nature of the nature of the relationship between you as director and actor. Also. Yeah, I think you make a really, yeah, yeah, you make a really important point there that it has to do with trust and, and comfort and, and all of that as well, that, um, you know, ultimately as a director, I need to recognize that the actors are looking to me for that solution that they may not come up with on their own um and i'm this you know as an actor when you've directed me sean i've i've you know there are things where i know i make a choice i make a decision and then there are other things where i'm looking to you for yeah. that guidance so yeah, you know. and, and, and directing you is, is a lot like directing cat a cat you know it just you, you, i can make suggestions but you're you're just going to go anywhere you want to go i'm kidding <laughs> 
<laughs> See, now is this toxic authority or hierarchy? No, that's, that's, that's called humor. That's yeah. called that's called that's called playful humor. And it speaks to <laughs> our personal relationship. Right, right. And you can okay boomer me too, ageist. Uh you're Gen X. I'll give you that. Yeah. Can I okay Gen X you? Is that a thing? Yeah, oh, I, I like doing that. I'm not really. Yeah, I, I, you can X me. I yeah. can, is that what we're doing? Are we, are we X? I'm just gonna. That? I'm gonna do yeah. that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. Age wise, I'm a. I'm a. I'm definitely a boomer, but behavioral wise, I'm a Gen X. I don't. I don't trust myself with any responsibility. But then I get angry when nobody gives it to me. Now, see, I was. I was. Uh, I was giving you the benefit of the doubt and placing you in Gen X. Oh so. yeah, but we, that's because you know my behavior, not my age. Oh, you know my age. I'm 57. Everybody knows my age. Yeah. No surprises. <laughs> Um, I do one final kind of area I'd love to address with you. And, and that's this idea that, you know, I think many of us in our head or many of us who have been doing theater for a long period of time, there's a stereotypical director mm -hmm. in our head. Right. And, and I love uh, any Simpsons fans out there. Uh, John Lovitz is yes. the, the actor who directs <laughs> street, the, in the episode Streetcar Named Marge. Um, and, and he really kind of personifies that stereotypical passionate director who I think he says has, he's directed three shows and ha has had three heart attacks. Yeah. Um, that That's how much he cares, something to that extent. Anyway, the idea being that, you know, artists are passionate individuals, right? And I think, yeah. again, there there's a tendency to maybe use that as an excuse or for people who are stepping into the role of director, maybe for the first time, yeah. to think that that's the way that they're supposed to behave. Right. How do you dissuade people of that notion? Well, you know, it's it's hard because I, I, I it took me, you know, it, it took me seven years and almost a hundred two hundred credits <laughs> to get to the place where I understood myself as a director. And part of part of learning directing was learning my own approach, uh, my approach toward uh, personnel management, um, my ability to conduct uh, actors, to control, manipulate actors, um, the strategies which worked for me and felt authentic, and the strategies which did not. Um, I, you know, some of that is exploring, and, and, and those continue to change over time, too. So I'm, I'm not the same director I was 32 years ago when I first came to Gannon. I'm a very diff different director now. Um, part of that uh, also is, is about taking the time to discover self and also discover whether you really are a director. I think sometimes people think of directing as something that all actors have to come to eventually. You know, like I've, I've, I've been in so many shows. Isn't it my turn to direct? You know, the same way that some actors are like, I've, I've, I've been to the chorus 14 times. Isn't it my time to have a named role? And I don't know what that, I, I, I oftentimes don't know what, I don't know what that means. You know, I, I love giving opportunities to everybody, but, but same thing with directing. It is not something that everybody should do. It's not something that everybody has the sure. gift to do. You know what I mean? Um, I, I feel called to directing uh, I because I, I, I'm not a detail person. I love acting. Don't get me wrong. I, I really do. But as a, as a creative artist, I like the, the thousand foot view. Right. Mm -hmm. I like looking at the entire stage picture. I like looking at the entire mise-en-scene. I like looking at the entire cast production. Um, so, so I have a disposition that leads me to that place. I don't want, I, I can't not do that, right? Um, so I, I, I think part of our part of our journey to directing is something that is, it, it's not, it's not for everybody. It's just not. And sometimes we don't have the disposition to be kind or to be collaborative, um, and we shouldn't try to fake it because then we run into other other situations. It's also about seasons, you know. I've been I've been a nice director and I've been an asshole director. Can I say asshole? I just sure. Um, it's Facebook you know, I, and I've YouTube. Both, you know, I've been both depending on the situation, um, and it's difficult because it's you know, we we also change over time and things. But yeah, I I I, I have actually come to a place now where I, I really kind of prefer directing to acting. Um, mm -hmm. I enjoy I enjoyed performing for a very long time, uh, but my. Um, my passion does not come from hearing applause for myself and a performance as much as appreciation expressed for productions that I have guided, facilitated, uh, and uh, helped to coach. Yeah. yeah. I do want to ask one more thing, just because I, if people are watching this and thinking, you know, maybe thinking on their own experiences as actors, as, as members of a company, and, um, you know, they find themselves in 
frankly, an unhealthy environment. Um, any advice or, or what would you advise someone to do in, in that situation? Yeah, what's wellness first, always self wellness first, recognize yeah. where you are, um, recognize if it is a toxic environment, um, recognize the first thing you need to do is remove yourself, you know, step out, put yourself in a place where you are healthy, uh, where you are protected, where you are safe. Um, if there are individuals who have been facilitators of this, uh, letting people know. I think it's really important too. Nobody should ever feel like they they are the victim who needs needs not to be heard. If you feel, and we know this with harassment in general, if you feel you've been harassed, you have been harassed, right? Mm -hmm. the, the issue is, was it intentional? The issue what is, uh, was it aggressive? Uh, was it dynamic? Um, and in those situations, we need to pursue those things. Um, uh, 25 years ago, we had a tendency to just not say anything. Um, I'm kind of glad those days are over. I, I, I like it when when a, when a student says to me, "I'm sorry, but but what you just said was was hurtful to me." I always like the the option and the opportunity to respond with, "I am sorry," um, and I will try to be more sensitive. Um, in this uh, consequence culture, um, we we've seen those individuals. Uh, um, who have not necessarily been able to express uh, an apology that works. Um, and uh, we've seen those individuals whose apologies are absolutely sincere and you know that they're going to take steps toward being more aware of the, the things they say and do. Um, helping people to become more aware is really helpful. Uh, those individuals who have held the mirror up to me and made me face some of my moments have made me stronger, have made me better, have made me um, uh, a more sensitive individual. And so I appreciate I appreciate when, when somebody says something to me. Yeah. Um, but but really important to, to not stay in a, an, an unhealthy relationship, whether that be a personal or an intimate relationship or a professional artistic collaboration. And I would just add to that that within the many different organizations out there that, that you might be participating with, uh, volunteering with, that there are um, hierarchies mm -hmm. in a good way <laughs> in place um, that that hopefully you can turn to to rectify those types of situations. Right. Um, Sean, to your point, it, it might mean that it's best for you to step away, but you know, tell someone in a position of power in that organization why it is that you're stepping away or you know maybe it's a situation that that won't necessarily require you to step away because right. it's something that can be addressed within that organization i would certainly hope that if there's ever anything you know at drama shop that that folks would feel empowered to um to if it's something that needs to go to me or above me to our board of, of governors that um, those structures are in place to to hopefully absolutely you know, and that address those types available of available on every organization website it's available in every program it's all there yeah. Right. Always. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and take care of self. Always take care of ourselves. Absolutely. Uh, well, Sean, I really appreciate you taking the time to address this topic. I know it's, it's uh, a challenging one and, and not always easy for folks to talk about, but important to talk about for sure. Absolutely. And actually the more we talk about it, the easier it gets. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. If you do have any additional comments or questions, drop them and uh, we will, uh, follow up and and chat back at you there on the, the Facebook chat uh, or Facebook uh, post as well um, if we didn't address anything today. So, Sean, it's a beautiful day out there. I don't want to keep you any longer. Get outside and enjoy this beautiful I'm day. I'm going to go watch Elena Manchester's medieval comedy, Rosavita. That's right. With horses. With horses. <laughs> Live horses. If that doesn't get you there, I don't know what will. So, All right, folks. Uh, again, I do want to mention uh, coming up on May 14th, our staged reading of Hamlet, uh, 8 o'clock Eastern and on demand after the fact as well. And coming up on May 9th, auditions for a not yet announced production directed by Father Sean Clerkin. Uh, so more to come on that. Stay tuned. Keep following us on social media for details on that as well. Sean, have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and we will okay. see you soon. Take care. Bye, everybody.